Well, hi, everyone. For seven days after we participated in Passover, many of us will be eating unleavened bread during the days of unleavened bread, not regularly, not regular bread and crackers. I find it interesting, by the way, that Ezekiel 5.21 talks about Passover, um, a feast of seven days. That's Ezekiel 45.21. So I might call or refer to it as the um, Passover season, because certainly Ezekiel 45, 21 seems to indicate that. My question, though, is who does that unleavened bread that we eat picture? I believe this study will open a lot of exciting new outlooks for many of you. It did for me, even as I prepared it and kept working on it. For many years, many of us believed, were taught, and I taught, that the unleavened bread during the days of unleavened bread pictures us, pictures us putting sin out of our lives once our sins are forgiven, which was pictured by Passover. But is that correct? Does the unleavened bread that we eat for a week picture us? Unleavened bread is bread that's absent any yeast, any leavened or uh, leavening, which is usually a picture of sin in the Bible. Uh, the Bible speaks of malice and wickedness that leavens a type of malice and wickedness. I'll put the scriptures in the notes, which I recommend you will print out. Um, false doctrine is called leaven, Matthew 16, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, or even hypocrisy, Luke 12, verse 1. <clears throat> All of those are things that spread quickly if allowed to get in. So leaven usually pictures bad stuff, but not always. Yeshua also used leaven to picture the kingdom of God in that it will spread rapidly once he starts to set it up here on earth at his return as ruling over the earth. To help us be crystal clear who the unleavened bread represents, I want to ask you this. What did you do with all the leaven products you had? <clears throat> did we try to salvage, fix it, or convert any of it to unleavened bread? Would you have been able to pick out the leaven out of the leavened loaf? Trying to make it unleavened? Of course not. What did we have to do? We had to throw it all out. In terms of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, leaven products had no further use. And so then what did we do? We had to either bake or buy brand new bread, unleavened bread, this time we're bringing back into our lives, into our homes, unleavened bread. And that becomes our kind of bread for the week. Bread that we haven't had in the house before. Do you see where I'm going with this? This next point is crucial to understand the theme I'm getting to here. Remember that leaven is a type of sin, except for the one place where it's compared to the kingdom. Unleavened bread has never before been leavened, ever. And once unleavened bad bread is baked, it never can be leavened, never will be leavened. So unleavened bread pictures a life that has never ever sinned, and never ever can sin, and never ever will sin. Does that sound like you and me? <laughs> What alone can be the one being, who alone can be the one being pictured by unleavened bread? At Passover, we're forgiven all of our sins by the blood of the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John the Baptist said. So John 1, So it follows that we should want to live a life that's different now, living more righteously. Sure, that's what we heard, that's what we were taught, and that was correct. Therefore, in the past, it was usually taught that eating unleavened bread, this is the part I see differently now, we should be putting things out of our lives, as I'll continue to say all through this message. But the unleavened bread cannot picture us after Passover, even though we now are trying to live God's way, living righteously, as we now have put sin or leaven out of our lives. We put out sin, and now we're to show we're going in a new direction by eating unleavened bread and all it represents. So that's why I think it's incorrect to say unleavened bread pictures us putting sin out. 
First of all, the days of unleavened bread are many weeks removed from Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was given. We certainly won't be very successful living righteously without the Holy Spirit. And even with God's Spirit, we all still stumble and sin. Paul admitted that. You know that. And um, probably all of us, in fact, will sin during the days of unleavened bread. That's hardly unleavened bread, right? If we're sinning during the days of unleavened bread, and we can, certainly in, in things like gossip or uh, worrying or uh, pride, things that are sins, might not be adultery or murder or things like that, but they're still sins. Paul says in Romans 7, verses 14 to 20, that in his flesh, in his flesh, nothing good dwells. That's pretty stark. Of course, he had the, the good Holy Spirit, so that's why he said, in my flesh, nothing good dwelt. And he admitted he still did things he hated. If our flesh has nothing good in it, could anything be salvageable out of something that's described as nothing good? Apostle Paul explains the old self needs to be tossed out, just like we did the leavened bread products. We cannot salvage or fix or improve or convert our old fleshly nature. Now that will look like we're being converted because we still have both natures. When others look at us changing, they'll say we're being converted. But you can't convert something in whom there's nothing good. It's, it's tossed out. It's killed. It's starved. We're not trying to salvage it. But many of us do try to make the old carnal fleshly nature better. Instead, we should be trying to replace it like we did the old leaven with the new unleavened bread. We should be trying to replace our old nature with the new creation spirit life, the new nature that is Christ. This is a key point. Remember, we cannot pick leaven out of leavened bread. We cannot pick the sin out of our old sinful flesh. It has to be trashed, replaced with new unleavened bread, with a new life. We can't make our old nature good. It must be trashed, replaced with someone who has nothing but good in him. The old nature has nothing but bad in it. Do you see how scripture says that? So key to understanding this is to remember that now we have two natures inside of us. We have the old sinful heart. So even, But even now, if I ask people who have God's Spirit, what kind of heart do you have? Most of you, most of them would say, my heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Quoting Jeremiah 17, 9. And if you want to continue quoting about our heart and nature, Romans 8, uh, verses 5, 6, and 7, and 8, talks about it cannot submit to God or His way. Cannot. But now we have the new creation life of Christ in us who loves God, wants to obey God, always did. In fact, he didn't say or do anything unless the Father showed him what to say and do. He wants to submit to God the Father. This new heart we have is not deceitful above all things, is not something we create. It's not desperately wicked. It's something you and I receive. David pleaded for the Creator after his sin of murdering Uriah and after he had had adultery with his wife. David pleaded for the Creator to create in me a clean heart, O God. Restore a right spirit within me. Psalm 51.10 God, you, please, you, give me a new heart. Now, if you have God's Spirit, if I was to ask you again what your heart is like, please... Now do not cite Jeremiah 17, 9. That was your old, wicked, deceitful heart that you're trying to let die and tossed out. Our new heart wants to do right, wants to obey, wants to fight sin, wants to love God's law and God's way. Your new heart loves God. We used to have a hymn in our hymnal, Oh, how love I thy law, it is ever with me. Right? But remember, you still also have that old heart that you do everything you can to destroy. But that's not you now. That's not you anymore. I don't want to identify with that. 
Our old self could not submit, obey, or please God. That should be our old self now. So we're not trying to make the fleshly nature good enough now for the kingdom of God. It's not how it works. You can't make it good enough. You can't refurbish it. It has to be thrown out. It has to be replaced. Actually, it should die. And in fact, if I were to ask any of you, are you in the flesh? Whenever I have asked that, most people I've asked that question to responded with, of course I'm still in the flesh. I bleed, don't I? You bleed. Of course we're still in the flesh. And then I read Romans 8, verses 6 to 10. I'm reading out of the NASB, especially verse 9. Let's start in verse 6. The mind set on the flesh is death. The mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh, this is Romans 8, verse 7 now. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God. Are you hostile to God? The real you? After God gave you his Holy Spirit, are you hostile to God? I'm not. Do I act sometimes like I am? Yes. Yes, I'll admit that. But that's when I let the old nature thrive instead of the new nature. The mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, Romans 8, 7, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it's not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9, Romans 8, 9, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. Verse 9 again, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Now verse 8 said, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9, if we are now in the Spirit, that's also telling us we can please God. Now... You are not in the flesh. So if I ask, if anyone asks you again, are you in the flesh? The answer is absolutely not. I have God's spirit. I am now in the spirit. We now have a new spirit life living for righteousness. But can, but can uh, you say you are now in the spirit? I didn't say you're a spirit being. I said you're in the spirit. And that new you is alive because of righteousness. We just read it. But whose righteousness is it? If you've been watching and reading my recent sermons, I have a couple sermons titled something like Receiving God's Righteousness by Faith. God says he will credit us, bequeath us with his righteousness. It's all through Romans 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and even the end of 9. It's all through there. Romans 5, 17, the gift of God's righteousness, a gift we hardly ever hear about. So is it your own righteousness from all your own hard work at getting better? No. True righteousness is not by our works. True righteousness is by faith, not by our own efforts. Here's a little tip. Our new life is not about you and me. It's always about Jesus, our Savior. Jesus, the anointed one. Christ means anointed one. Messiah means anointed one. Sometimes I'll say Jesus, the anointed, okay? Who saved us and continues to save us day by day. We are being saved in that as we do once in a while continue to sin, he still saves us. He fights that infection. We're now in his body, in his very flesh, and his bones, it says at the end of Ephesians 5. So now, when, as I've explained before, now when we have an attack on our body, and, and, and we have a cut, so to speak, we've sinned, God's blood rushes to cleanse it, to get rid of it out of the body. We're being saved, and we have been saved. Getting back to our analogy, is this righteousness we now have come about, has it come about, uh, because we picked the leaven out of the leavened bread, our lives? No. 
Or is it because we brought in perfect new unleavened bread into our homes and lives? Unleavened bread that has never before been leavened, never will be. Hallelujah, that is our Savior. In my notes, I'll capitalize from this point on probably unleavened bread because I'm picturing the one who is your new life and mine, Jesus the Anointed, Jesus Christ. And some of us often prefer the name his mama called him, Yeshua, the Messiah, Yeshua, salvation. Yeshua, the Anointed One. Messiah means that as well. He's the only one who's never sinned, never will, certainly won't during the days of unleavened bread or ever. He's the only one that the unleavened bread can picture. Because remember, unleavened bread has never been leavened. It can't be leavened now that it's baked and never will be. I want to read Romans 4.25 out of the New Living Translation. Romans 4.25 I was, uh, he, Christ, was handed over to die because of our sins. Romans 4.25 And he was raised to life he was resurrected, his new resurrection life, to make us right with God. Most of our Bibles say that for justification, New Living Translation explains that it makes us right with God. Because now he's living in us. Because though our past sins were forgiven, you and I still sin. We still sin. But now if his life comes into me, and if that's the life Christ uh, the life that God the Father sees, he's continuing to save us, raised to life to make us right with God. So this unleavened bread we eat for seven days cannot picture us. We've all been sinners like leavened bread that had leaven and who still occasionally still sin. So how can we say that the unleavened bread pictures us? Because unleavened bread cannot sin, will not sin, will not ha ever be able to be leavened is what I'm saying. And even during the days of leavened bread, we're very likely to sin, to be sinners, I mean. Our old self is what leavened bread that we throw out pictures. The unleavened bread has to picture our new life, and it's not us. The new life is Christ. So eating unleavened bread simply cannot picture us putting sin out so much as it pictures taking on the only, the only one, the perfect Son of God, who is, was, and will be forever unleavened, forever sinless. All right? Our part is a conscious effort to let the old self die and figurative, in figurative terms and then actively invite Christ actively with our very words speaking it out loud sometimes into our lives to be our lives. Say it to him. Confess it to him. Speak it to him. Our life is now all about him. All about him. Not about us. Unfortunately, we can't separate the old self and watch it being tossed into garbage cans like we did leavened bread. The old self remains inside of us, but must be the old self. We must be letting it die. We must be starving it. So it's no longer a factor. Romans 13, verses 13 to 14. I'll be talking more about how we starve it. Romans 13, 13 to 14. Actually, this verse says some of it. <clears throat> and let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness. Romans 13, 13 to 14. Not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our Lord. He's our conqueror. He's our leader. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. See, when we're tempted, it's because our flesh wants to do those things. Our spirit life may say, no, I don't really want to do that. We may hate ourselves as we do something we know is wrong. Or after we realize what we've done. The flesh wants to do it, though. The flesh, the flesh wants to gossip. The flesh wants to listen to gossip. The flesh wants to do sexual things that are wrong. The flesh wants to get drunk. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Our part is to go to Yeshua, bury our pride, surrender to him, surrender. Let's say the words in prayer to our master Yeshua, the Messiah. You know, when the Japanese had the, 
get, I think it was the USS Missouri, uh, they, they had to come and finally come up to MacArthur and others and to their representatives of the other combatants uh, on, on each side and, and say, we surrender. Imagine how humiliating and humbling that was. Let's be sure we feel that. Let's say the words in prayer to our master, Yeshua, the Messiah, the anointed one. He's our conquering king who conquered us. Let's let him really conquer us, you and me. Everything about us must be given up. Everything has to be surrendered unconditionally to the, our new Lord, master and conqueror. I realize now that though I thought I had surrendered in my younger years, I've been keeping Passover now for, what is it, 52 years now. I kept way too much of my old fleshly nature unsurrendered. And so it evidenced itself in sins in my life. So did you. I heard and I preached sermons on unconditional surrender. But most of us hadn't really done that. I hadn't. I thought I had. And I kept it alive. I kept it alive by feeding it in ways I see now were entirely wrong. All the while, I also went to church, I worshipped, I prayed, and I thought I was also in the Spirit. But the days of unleavened bread show us tossing out the old self. Our part is to open the door to him, invite him in to have dinner with us, like Zacchaeus did. And as the Laodiceans are urged to do at the end of Revelation 3. He's knocking on our door. I want to come in. I want to eat with you. I want to have supper with you. Open the door. If you will, I'll eat with you. The end of Revelation 3. We must stop feeding the old self with desires and lust that keep it alive. Instead, we have to starve that side and now focus on the new life. Romans 13, verses 13 to 14. I said earlier, I want to read verse 14 again. Put on the Lord Jesus. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. So if you know this phone call to somebody is not going to leave, not going to end you feeling spiritual, don't make the phone call. If watching certain things, whether it be Facebook or Netflix or wherever you go, are going to be the kinds of things that will excite the wrong nature, don't do it. Fight it. Yes, you fight it with Jesus Christ leading. Follow his lead. I hope you can right now list some areas of your life that you're changing so you're sure not to be feeding the old nature. Maybe it's what you watch on TV or your computer. Or maybe it's people you hang out with who are influencing, influencing you negatively. Or what you allow yourselves to think about and ponder. Paul says in Galatians 2, 20, 21, Galatians 2, 20, 21, I've crucified, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. I'm not alive anymore. Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Not faith in that I can do it, but faith in the Son of God who loved me, loved me, gave himself for me. I don't set aside the grace of God. If righteousness could come through the law, then Christ died in vain. So that's why Paul also says in Philippians 3, 9 and 10 that he didn't want. Please, all of you, get this. He, Philippians 3, 9 and 10. I don't hear this verse often being used. Please, you guys start preaching it. Philippians 3, 9 and 10. I don't want my own righteousness, which is from keeping the law. But I want the righteousness that is the righteousness of God that he gives me by faith in Jesus. And I want to come to know him and on the power of his resurrection, his life, his resurrected life. Galatians 5.24, those who belong to Christ Jesus, NIV here, Galatians 5.24, have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. I'm a very passionate person. There are times to be passionate, but beware. Passion is often put in context of negative sin. Crucify the sinful nature with its passions and desires. 
passions often implies emotional responses. I'm emotional. So I, I'm watching those things that I don't get angry because emotions been stirred up. I don't get lustful because emotions been stirred up, whatever. I'm confessing to you. I think these are things that certainly apply to many of you too, true too as well. Sure, surely doesn't it? Don't they? Colossians 3, 3 and 4, for you died. Did you? Colossians 3, 3 and 4, you died. Your life is hidden with Christ. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears. Christ is now our life. When he appears, you will appear with him in glory. Do you remember Romans 8 verse 9? But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if you have God's spirit. And verse 14 says, Romans 8, 14 says, you you're belong to God if you, if you uh, are led by God's spirit. So you and I should be in the spirit now. I did not say we're spirit beings. I said we are spiritual beings in the spirit. And as we now eat unleavened bread these seven days, that's showing our perfect new spiritual life it's not me but it's christ living in me christ who has never sinned will never sin certainly not during the days of unleavened bread we're to put on the anointed one and yeshua is now the one the father sees as your new creation life second corinthians five seventeen. you are a new creation in christ i'll read that later on here galatians in fact, i'll read it now since i've just mentioned it if anyone is in Christ, we have to be in him. 2 Corinthians 5.17 It's easy to understand how he's in us. We have to be in him. Part of him. If anyone is in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17 He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And in the verse or two before that, he says, Stop thinking of people the way you knew them before, as having done this or that stupid, sinful, sinful, sinful thing, or as being a drunk or being lustful or whatever. Stop thinking of each other that way. Okay, Galatians. So from now on, we have to activate him. We truly are resisting. We truly are fighting. With Christ leading us, our carnal old self still wants, that, uh, you know, fighting the things that our carnal old self still wants to do. Galatians 5, 16 and 17, NIV, Galatians 5, verses 16 and 17, New International Version. I say, live by the Spirit, you won't gratify the desires of the sinful nature. That means we have to feed the spiritual side. The sinful nature desires what's contrary to the Spirit, the Spirit contrary to the sinful nature. So they're, at, they're in conflict with each other so that you often don't do what you want. They're in conflict. So our job is to feed the spiritual side, starve the other side. That will take work and, and focus. Please do it, all of us. In Romans 8, verses 12 to 14, we're debtors now to live according to the Spirit if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds, put to death the deeds of the body. This, is, this has to become a war. This has to be something you're very conscious on, that every morning you take time to pray. Even if, even if you can't do a half-hour prayer, a 15-minute prayer, get down on your knees and pray every morning, every night, and all throughout the day without ceasing, constant contact. Put on the armor of God instead of going out there in just your plain underwear as you fight the most powerful beings who are anti-God, who are hateful demons. We need that. We will win. For he who is in us is stronger, greater than he who is in the world. That's in First John. Now in Romans 8, verses 12 to 14, we're debtors, I, I said then, to uh, put to death the deeds of the body. Our whole life now is being lived solely and wholly for Jesus and more and more by Jesus, for him and by him. Paul calls the old self the old man. 
In Ephesians 4, verse 24, he says to get rid of that and put on the new man. But we all still look at our many failures, our many weaknesses. We have a really hard time believing that we're, e that we're even new creations. We just still see too much of the old nature coming up. I know, I, I've prayed on my knees, Father, please, am I really a new creation? Sometimes I really doubt it, Father. Yeshua, come into my life, be my new me. And let me be encouraged that you are, you are changing me. You see what I'm saying? It's hard to really believe when we focus on our failures that God has bequeathed us with a wonderful gift of his very own righteousness. Romans 5, 17, the gift of righteousness, God's own righteousness that we receive by faith. Sometimes it takes a while to see something we want to see by faith. I mean, look. God promised Abraham that your generations after you will come out of here. It took four, over 400 years before that really happened. 430 years. Sometimes it takes a while. When God told Abraham at 75, you're going to have so many children by age 99, he still had zero by Sarah. So though you may not feel you see the new creation, believe it. Faith is the evidence of things not seen yet. <laughs> we'll see it. It's key to understand that the new you and the new me takes a while to fully develop to the stature of the fullness of Christ, as we're told in Ephesians 4, verse 11 to 14. So Jesus was clear. He's the bread from heaven. On your own, please read John 6, verses 47 to 58. And he says, if you don't eat of me and drink of my blood, you have no part in me. He's the unleavened bread of Passover. He's the unleavened bread, period. Can only picture him. Throughout this week of unleavened bread, after we partook of the bread and wine of Passover, even going, going on as we remembering that he is saving us, those of us who are being saved. He is the new life. He is the unleavened bread. Romans 4.25, New Living. He was handed over to die because of our sins. He was raised to life to make us right with God. I said that earlier, but I wanted to read it again. So when we eat of him during the week, picturing his life, his righteousness, we're admitting we want the old leaven self gone, replaced by him. So we still have the both natures, but we must make no provision for the flesh. So don't be spending time with activities, chats, and thoughts that stir up the fleshly nature of hatred and gossip and violence and lust and vanity, what, depression, what else, worry, sin. That's called feeding the flesh. That's why we canceled, after a very short time of having it, Netflix. I was seeing too much gore. I was hearing profanity too much, F-words, God's name in vain taken out. We tried not to pick movies that would have anything like that, but it was still there. I would never invite people into my home who would curse and lie and steal and kill and take their clothes off in front of me. I never would do that. But here I was inviting them in through Netflix. No need for that. Cancel it. Instead, what we can do is spend much more time feeding the Spirit in quiet meditation with God. In prayer and Bible study, be filled with His Word. Be in constant contact all through the day, 20, 25, 30 times a day, short bursts of one, two-minute prayers, one or two-minute prayers that we praise Him and thank Him and bless Him and ask for help and ask for other people to be healed, inviting him into our life. The key to understand this is God is not trying to change my old self. He wants a new creation. He wants to start over. 
It's like having a rebuilt transmission or a brand new one. We're getting a brand new one. We're not reformed. We're not being refurbished. We're being made completely new by our union with Christ, pictured by the unleavened bread. The new creation is by the Creator. There's only one Creator. It's not you and me. God does it. We open the door. We listen. We follow His lead. We obey. These are all things we got to do. And then we let Him lead us by His Spirit as He nudges us and speaks to us. And if God ever speaks to you with these strong thoughts or nudges that you just know somehow know it wasn't from you, you know it had to be from God, you better listen to those things. Test the Spirit. Yes, of course. But listen. And you will have more and more of those. When I don't listen to those, I find that the Word of God coming into my heart and mind are more and more infrequent. Could be something like call somebody or send a card of encouragement to so-and-so or don't respond angrily to this person. A, a soft answer turns away wrath, the book of Proverbs says. A soft answer. Now, it means a soft, loving answer. You can have a soft answer and be saying, I hope you die. <laughs> That's not what it means, okay? Anyway, so there are things that we do, but the changes and the newness is all by God and Christ working in us. Are we getting it? Uh, so now look at all areas of your life. What do I still need to surrender and change by God's Spirit, by Christ in me? Let's take just, for example, a few verses. Forgive one another as Christ has forgiven you. As Christ has forgiven you. Who haven't you forgiven? How about this one? Husbands, love your wife as Christ loves his church. And when your wife is being unlovable, love her anyway. Like Christ does us. While we were yet sinners, his love was so great he died for us. Wives, submit and respect your own husbands as you would to the Messiah himself. Yeah, even when he's being a jackass. I don't mean Messiah, I mean your husband. Submit and respect your husbands as you would if that were Jesus Christ. These are tough ones to do. Husbands, honor your wives, that your prayers be not hindered. Church, respect and honor the other brethren, that healing can start happening in the body. Are you getting it? It might look to others that that's us changing as they see these things happening, but it's not our doing, it's God's. We're being a new creation. So for seven days, as we eat unleavened bread, we tell ourselves, this is the Son of God coming into me. Tell Yeshua, Master, my conquering King who's conquered me, I surrender, and I welcome you to come into me with your resurrection life. Live again in me the way you lived before, obediently, happily, humbly, and perfectly. Let me now have faith in you, let me now be displaying the fruit of your righteousness and your works. The fruit of his righteousness is mentioned in Philippians 1.11. We display his fruit. He's the one who produces the fruit. Remember, I've talked about that in recent sermons. I'm the vine, you're the branches, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, lest it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Right? But if you abide in him, we can bear much fruit. But he's the one providing it. He's the one producing the fruit. We display his fruit. But he's the one who produces it. It's his righteousness. Let's read some more of God's word. Then consciously eat of his body, eat of his flesh, all through the days of unleavened bread. It's him. It's not us we're taking in. It's not us we're picturing. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6 to 8, Your glorying, glorying is not good. Do you 
not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore throw out your old self. <laughs> throw out the old leaven that you, so I'm not making this up, that you may be a new lump. So Paul is comparing the leaven to the old self and the new leaven with being a new lump. That you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, Passover pictured Yeshua, pictured Jesus, the Messiah. Indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep this feast. Let us keep the feast. If any of you are wondering about whether you should keep the feast, be obedient to God's word. Let us keep the feast. Not just Passover. Not just the Lord's Supper. Let us keep the feast. Not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread. This is talking about the way we are to be. You see, all the way through this, I've been talking about leaven and unleavened bread as being the old self and now the new self, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And we know that who is truth? Jesus said he is the truth. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he made him who knew no sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him, Christ, who knew no sin. He'd never been leavened. To be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. How in him. I hope you hear the sermons on receiving God's own righteousness. It's something you've got to believe and study. Please accept it when you see it's true. God has given you himself, his perfection, his righteousness. John 14, 23, Jesus answered, said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we Father and I, okay, we will come to him and make our home with him. So we become the temple of the living God, eating of Christ each one of the days, of the days of unleavened bread and beyond, really, which should make us aware. When I say beyond, I said we should be remembering the lesson that from now on I want to feed the spiritual nature, starve the other nature, cut out things that are putting the carnal, impatient, wor worrisome, lustful, unforgiving. Some of you have a real hard time forgiving others. Forgiving your husband, maybe. That's the old nature. Become as Christ, who while we're still sinners, died for us. We become the temple of the living God. As we eat unleavened bread, it should make us aware of the holy, powerful presence of our God and Jesus Christ inside of us, changing me and changing you. There's a song about changing me. Maybe Google it. Changing me, changing you. Until Christ is formed in you. Until the Anointed One is formed in you. Galatians 4, 19. Until Christ is not until you get better, until Christ, until the unleavened bread is for real in you. We become what we eat. Hallelujah. Praise God our Abba and Yeshua our salvation. That's what his name means. Enjoy your time with Abba, our dear daddy in heaven, who happens to be God Almighty, the greatest being in the whole universe, God the highest. And enjoy your time also with Yeshua, the King of Kings, the mighty God, everlasting Savior, Emmanuel, Prince of Peace, God with us, Emmanuel. May their presence inside of us change us, make us new, make us a holy saint. Holy Father in heaven, we come to you. We thank you so much for the Passover season. We thank you for the bread and the wine of Passover. We thank you. We praise your holy name that Yeshua, the resurrection life of Yeshua, continues to save us. Pictured by us taking the unleavened bread completely, perfectly for seven days, the seven days of the days of unleavened bread, we who knew no righteousness, we who knew no righteousness now receive you 
And you who knew no sin took our sin. The big exchange, the big swap. Thank you, dear Jesus. Thank you so much, Yeshua. Please now help us to really fight, get rid of, crucify, and put to death the old nature. Help us to really surrender to you, Yeshua, to say so in words, on our knees, head on the floor, deep worshiping you, deeply worshiping you. Let's make no excuses for sin. Let us make no excuses for sin. We can't say it's all right to lie because Abraham did. No. So, Father, help us understand that that's wrong thinking. Help us to not excuse any sin in our lives. We must be honest and truthful. We must be holy. We must be righteous. But it must be you living in us and you that is seen in us. Thank you for everything you are, everything you've done. We praise you and we surrender to you, give you our lives, and you give us yours. In Yeshua the Messiah's mighty name, Amen and Amen. Amen. <laughs>